I'm Nick, and you're watching Signal Ditch. Today's video is all about rare loot, those materials that are used in tube making that are difficult to come by if you're a hobbyist or an amateur, either because there aren't very many suppliers anymore, or because the suppliers that do exist don't sell on the retail market. I'll take you through four rare items from my collection and explain what they are, what they're used for, and how I manage to source them. I'll even give you the names of some sources, as well as MOQs and ballpark pricing. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Number one on the list is this bottle of cathode coating. To understand what cathode coatings are used for, we need to go back to the first video in this series where I talked about thermionic emission. You'll remember that vacuum tubes basically work by emitting electrons from one surface that we call the cathode, and then catching them on another surface which we call the anode. But why did the electrons leave the cathode in the first place? The metal of the cathode contains a sea of mobile electrons that are shared between all of the atoms in the metal. And we know from thermodynamics that all of these electrons won't have the same velocity. Some of them will be higher and some lower than the average. Some of these electrons will have enough velocity to actually escape the surface of the cathode and not get drawn back in. The minimum amount of energy that it takes for this to happen is called the work function. Thermionic emission happens when you heat up the metal of the cathode enough that more of those electrons have enough energy to overcome the work function. This strategy does have its drawbacks, however, because you can't get the cathode infinitely hot. Eventually, it's going to melt. What you need is a material with a very high melting point and a very low work function. This is why tungsten is usually used for the filaments in directly heated cathodes. Even though tungsten does have a relatively low work function, tungsten filaments still have to operate white hot, around 2500 Kelvin. Even then, you're seeing relatively low emission current for the amount of wattage that you're putting in just to heat the filament. In my first video, I discussed one way that this is addressed, which is to add 1-2% to thorium into the tungsten metal. When the thoriated tungsten filament is heated, thorium atoms migrate to the surface and create an atomically thin emissive layer with a much lower work function than the tungsten itself. Thoriated tungsten filaments can operate at a slightly lower temperature, around 2000 Kelvin, but their emission current at that temperature is much higher. Generally speaking, the cooler you can run your cathode, the better off you are. The cathode's going to last longer and the tube will be more efficient. But if you want to move your operating region from white hot down to dull orange, you're going to need to actually use a material with a much lower work function that's applied to the outside of the cathode. This is where these cathode coatings come in. This bottle contains a mixture of barium, strontium, and probably calcium carbonate, dissolved in methyl methacrylate, and probably thinned with something like xylene. You apply this solution to the surface of your cathode, and then under vacuum, heat up the cathode to the processing temperature, and all of those carbonates get converted to their oxides. Barium and strontium oxide are both excellent electron emitters, so you don't have to get the cathode anywhere near white hot before you start to see emission currents that are much higher than what you would see from a thoriated tungsten cathode of the same surface area. I mentioned that I don't know exactly what's in this bottle, and that's because it's something that I bought surplus on eBay. One of my Twitter followers is a consulting engineer for a company that builds vacuum electron devices. They sent me a DM to let me know that there was a shop closing, and that the guy was selling his back stock of this cathode coating really cheaply on eBay. The only information that the seller had was that it contained barium and strontium, and he thought maybe calcium but didn't know for sure. He also believed that the solvent system is methyl methacrylate, but again, didn't have any proof for that. The solvent binder system tells you how the coating was intended to be applied. The methyl methacrylate sort of suggests that this is intended for a cataphoretic coating process and not for a spray coating process. However, there is someone who knows for sure, and that's Ceramic Coatings Incorporated. Actually, according to Google, they're now Advanced Ceramic Coatings Incorporated, and they're still located at the same address that's on my bottle here. I've written them an email asking for a datasheet or even just an SDS for this product. I haven't heard back from them yet, but it's only been a few days. I'm sympathetic to the fact that it's not their job to do tech support for the secondary market, so even if I don't hear back from them, I'm not going to hold it against them. In the meantime, we can trial and error our way through it if we have to. We can also contact other suppliers for similar products and see what they have to say. I'm afraid at the moment I don't have a whole lot more information to give you about this one. It sort of just fell into my lap, but it is rare loot, so I thought it should be on the list. Number two on the list is cathodoluminescent phosphor. One type of vacuum device that I definitely want to experiment with is the vacuum fluorescent display. 
The light in a vacuum fluorescent display comes from phosphors that are applied to the anode. When electrons emitted from the cathode hit this phosphor, it stimulates the emission of visible light photons. Actually, the incident electrons have too much energy to do this, and it's the secondary electrons that actually stimulate this emission, but that's as deep as we can get into it before we have to talk about band gaps and valence electrons. Anyway, these phosphors have to have pretty particular properties to do this trick at the low voltages associated with vacuum fluorescent displays. The color of visible light that's emitted is dependent on the phosphor, different phosphors for different colors, but the classic blue-green phosphor that you see in many vacuum fluorescent displays can be attributed to zinc-doped zinc oxide. On a tip from someone in a Discord, I found a company called Phosphor Technology in England. They formulate a line of phosphors specifically for field effect and other low voltage displays. Of course, zinc oxide is among those phosphors, so I emailed them to see what they charge. I explained to them that I was a hobbyist and I wasn't likely to buy any large amounts of phosphor powder anytime soon. They explained that their minimum order quantity was 0.1 kilograms, or 100 grams, and that that was more than I was likely to ever need. They also said they were happy to send me a 5 gram sample for free, which I happily accepted. Just for fun, I did get pricing from them and it was a little more reasonable than I expected. A minimum order of their zinc doped zinc oxide phosphor, which I have here, would be 300 US dollars plus shipping. And in the world of mail order white powders, that's really not too bad. And if that sounds expensive, well, just wait until you hear about the other things on the list. The phosphor arrived as an extremely fine powder. I don't have any genius strategy for how I'm going to apply it to my anodes, but maybe I can learn some lessons from the solvent binder systems used in the cathode coatings. In the meantime, I'm doing my research on everything from dip coating to electrophoresis. I was kind of hoping the phosphor would be a little bit photoluminescent, but even under UV light, it barely fluoresces more than, say, baking soda. It definitely doesn't fluoresce as much as the paper used on the label. I guess if we want to see this stuff glow, we're going to have to figure out a way to fire electrons at it. Number three on the list is evaporable barium getters. You'll remember from the first video in this series that evaporable getters are an alloy of reactive metals that you evaporate onto the inside surface of your tube to react with and sequester oxygen and other nasty things that'll be evolved from your elements over time. Just like everything else on this list, there are plenty of devices we could make without evaporable getters, but if you want that classic vacuum tube look with the mirrored inside, you gotta have that flashed getter. Some amateur tube makers have even salvaged ring getters from other devices that were only partially flashed, but that can be hit or miss. If you search Alibaba for vacuum getters, you get a lot of results for vacuum thermos getters. These are non-evaporable pellet-type getters, and they might actually work for this application, but I want to start with something proven, and then we can experiment later. A Google search for vacuum getters basically just brings up SAES. And as far as I can tell, they are the world leader in vacuum getters and the supplier of most of the vacuum getters, both evaporable and non-evaporable, in the world. It is possible to buy getters from SAES, even as an individual, if you set up a small company and then contact them, they may even send you commercial samples. But you do have to talk to a salesperson, you have to explain what you're going to use them for, you have to sign an NDA saying that you're not going to sell them along to someone else down the line. It's kind of a lot of hassle. By pulling keywords from the SAES sales page about evaporable getters and googling those, I was able to eventually pull up another supplier of evaporable getters located in China. HDgetters.com is the website of Nanjing Huadong Electronics Vacuum Material Company Limited, and their website looked pretty promising, so I sent them an email. I explained that I'm a hobbyist, and told them which part numbers on their website I was interested in. They sent me back a datasheet for one of those parts and told me that they'd be happy to send me a sample. When I asked them about minimum order quantity, I was blown away. Their minimum order is 20,000 pieces. I asked about buying fewer devices, and he said he could quote me for 1,000 pieces, but it probably wouldn't be worth it, because it would cost just as much as buying 20,000 pieces. And when I looked at the quote, he was basically right. At 20,000 pieces, they want 38 cents a piece. For 1,000 pieces, they want $4.50 a piece. However, he asked for my FedEx account number and said that he could send me a free sample of 150 pieces, to which I gladly agreed and handed over my FedEx number. 
A few weeks later, a box arrived on my doorstep and it was a can of fresh, non-nitrogen-doped, evaporable barium getters. The getters are about 10 millimeters in diameter, they have a mounting wire already welded to them, and they yield about 8 milligrams of barium each. They ship in a pull tab can, which honestly I wasn't expecting, but it's kind of cool. The can is purged with dry nitrogen. On the data sheet, it says that once you open the can, you can leave the devices at ambient humidity for up to 24 hours, or you can store them for several weeks in a dry cabinet. I wanted to open the can to actually get a look at these things, but I needed some way to store them afterwards so that I wouldn't completely ruin all 150 of them. What I eventually settled on was a Pyrex media bottle with a Teflon seal. I filled the bottom of the bottle with silica gel desiccant beads, and then purged the atmosphere with argon gas, which is sold on Amazon under the brand name Bloxygen. Apparently people use it to preserve their opened cans of wood finish and oil paint. While I was transferring them from the can to the bottle, I left one out to play with and take measurements of, and if I can keep track of it one day, we'll fire it and compare it to the ones that are kept under a dry inert atmosphere. I'll probably never buy 20,000 evaporable getters, but if there's enough interest, I'm sure people could put together a group buy. I also have ideas about alloying my own evaporable getters in a vacuum induction furnace, and at least now I have a standard for comparison. Number four, and the final thing on the list, is the thing I'm most excited about because it was by far the hardest to track down. Button stems, or flat stems, are the tube bases used in the commercial manufacture of vacuum tubes. Strictly speaking, you absolutely do not need these to make your own vacuum tubes. You can totally do your own pinch seals, and they'll turn out fine. Button stems just seem like a great way to take out a lot of the guesswork for amateurs because they have all of the glass-to-metal seals pre-made and helium leak tested. Unfortunately, these button stems are basically unobtainium. Doing an internet search for vacuum tube bases pulls up sockets, like you would expect, and doing a search for vacuum tube stems doesn't pull up much of anything. If you search for vacuum feed-through, you pull up a lot of technical glass companies that I now understand probably could make these tube bases, but it isn't their bread and butter. At first, the only picture of one of these things that I could find on the entire internet was a picture from a Hackaday article about making tubes. In the article, they're referred to as a commercially available tube stem, but available from who? By extracting some of the keywords from the presentation in that Hackaday article, I was able to eventually stumble upon a website about the history of vacuum tubes that had another picture of these stems and a few more names for them, including button stems. Adding button stem to my search keywords did pull up a few more hits, but they still weren't suppliers. I was exhausting these keywords. I would do a Google search and I would just go all the way to the end of the results and not find what I was looking for, both in the image search and in the standard web search. For several days working on this on and off, I only had two images of the thing that I was trying to source. In desperation, I went back to the original Hackaday article and started reading through the comments to see if anyone else was trying to find a source for these vacuum stems. I did find someone in the comments section asking about tube bases, and the author of the article replied and suggested two glassworks companies in New Jersey, Richland Glass and Fredericks Glass, so I went to their websites and contacted both of them. As I was talking to the salespeople for both of these companies, I started to realize that there was an entire ecosystem of technical precision glass suppliers that I hadn't been aware of until now. If neither of these places had popped up in my web search so far, there were probably a bunch more that I didn't know about. So I started doing searches for technical glasswork and precision glasswork. These searches led me to a company called CTVM in France. I sent them an email asking about button stems or flat stems for vacuum tubes, and they said that they didn't really know what I was talking about even though it sounded like it was in their wheelhouse. So I sent them one of the pictures I'd managed to dig up, and they said, ah, we do know how to make these, but we make them the expensive way, because we make vacuum feed-throughs for research. You need to find someone who makes these as their bread and butter, someone like Moore's Glassworks in the UK. Once I had a name, I was able to Google search and pull up their website. What's wild about this is that their website is beautiful, and it contains all sorts of keywords that I had already searched, and they were never a result. I guess they're just not indexed? But under the Products tab, sure enough, there is a category, Multi-Pin Bases, and they had a beautiful picture of the exact type of tube base that I was looking for. 
So of course, I sent them an email straight away, and I started scraping their page for keywords that might help me find other suppliers. Using the term multi-pin base and a few other keywords from their site, I was able to pull another result for a company in China. In fact, I found two different companies in China that both make multi-pin bases and have both stolen each other's product images. After looking at both of their web pages and talking to salespeople from both of them, I'm almost certain that they are not the same factory with two different names. It really is two different factories, they've just used all of the same product images. But they are beautiful product images. I mean, there's like seven or eight pictures of vacuum tube stems that I couldn't find anywhere else in all of my searching. I wrote an email to all of these companies explaining that I'm a hobbyist, I'm probably not going to buy thousands of units from them, but I was curious to see if they had anything in stock. If they have anything that they'd be willing to sell me, I wasn't going to be too picky about what it was. I also wanted to know if they had a minimum order quantity, if they were willing to send me some samples, and just generally what they had laying around. The Chinese suppliers didn't appear to have any stock, but they did have stock tooling, so I didn't have to pay tooling costs if I bought one of the tube stems that they already manufacture, I just had to pay for the manufacture of the tube stems. At this point, I made a CAD drawing for reference so that I could explain what I was looking for. All three companies came back with stock products that were pretty similar in size. But Moore's Glasswork actually had built units in stock. I talked to the sales guy and he said that they'd be willing to sell me as few as 50 to 100 pieces. They would be about 12 bucks a piece, which is a little steep, but for something that you basically can't buy anywhere else, it's not a bad deal. He told me that they make about 100 different hard glass tube stems with Kovar pins, and they make 3 or 4 thousand of them a week and ship them all over the world. We even talked about what it would cost to make custom tube stems, and honestly, it's not that bad. It would be about $2,500 or $3,000 for the tooling, and then each stem would cost between $10 and $20 depending on the size and the number of pins. And, most importantly, he was able to send me a sample of 10 units at no cost. Around the same time, I got a message from another engineer here on YouTube, Lindsay Wilson. He had been down the same road a number of years ago and got his hands on some tube stems for cathode ray tubes, I believe? Unfortunately, his tube stems appear to be leaded glass, which would be incompatible with the borosilicate that I plan on using in my process. But he was kind enough to ship me a handful of them, as well as some other goodies, just in case I could find a use for them. In the meantime, I was getting quotes back from both of the Chinese manufacturers. Hebei Pengju Photoelectric Technology Company had three types of tube stems that were pretty close in size to what I was looking for, a 7-pin, a 9-pin, and a 15-pin. They would sell me as few as 50 pieces for prices ranging between $18 and $25 a piece, so higher but comparable to Moore's Glassworks. Wuhan Hengao Dian Electronics Technology Company got back to me about custom tube stem pricing, saying their MOQ was 200 pieces, there would be a tooling fee of $800 USD, and that the price for each piece would be $15. Again, not a terrible price per piece seems pretty on par with the rest of the market, but that MOQ is a killer. This is another one of those things where if there was a big enough hobby community, we could probably put our money together and get these things at a reasonable price, but as it stands, one person can't usually meet the MOQ required for these suppliers. Much like the evaporable getters, I have ideas about how you could manufacture these in a small shop, but it was important to get my hands on a commercial standard. Luckily, Moore's Glassworks came through and these things are absolutely beautiful. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. I hope it was informative, or at least entertaining. My next video is going to be all about the ultra-high vacuum system. The only problem is, it's not finished yet. But it gets closer every day, so if you want to be notified when that video comes out, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. Last weekend, I even went to a local university auction and I bought this used surface analysis system. A lot of the fun stuff has been taken off of it, so there's no x-ray source or spectrometer. I was really hoping I'd find maybe a residual gas analyzer, but no dice. However, there were two huge mechanical vacuum pumps and a turbo pump. Considering I paid a little over $400, I think I got my money's worth, but we'll talk about that in the next video as well. If you want to help me make these YouTube videos, you can go to patreon.com slash integrated therm, where you can become either a diode or triode level patron. All patrons get early access to the YouTube videos, and triode level patrons will get their names at the end of the video like you're seeing now. 
It also helps me out if you like and share the video. If you have any questions or suggestions, toss them in the comment section. I read all of the comments. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.